Life is good. We're safe. And at times, it's very relaxing. That's what's so great about this country. But there's a reason all of what I just said is true. Some take it for granted. Others could care less. Me? I thank them every chance I get. This sea of white headstones can be found in most major cities in America. I look out at a view like this and can't help but think of all those men who fought through hell. Some died on foreign soil, some came home. But every one of these headstones has a story to tell, with no one to tell it. All of these stories will go unheard for the rest of time. It's quiet here, but these headstones scream a million words for those who will listen. These were my heroes growing up. They didn't wear spandex, a cape. Hell, their underwear was underneath their pants. If it wasn't for the greatest generation, we would all be speaking Japanese or German. That's why telling the stories of those we have left is so beyond important to me. We are losing these heroes too rapidly. So my mission is to sit down with as many as I can, to let these unsung heroes have their chance to be heard, before it's too late. Charles J. Kundert, K-U-N-D-E-R-T. Okay, and what, uh, what branch were you with? There's only one branch, United States Marine Corps. As soon as I turned 17, I volunteered, but they didn't call me for about a month of that, two and a half months, because they were drafting 18-year-olds, and they wanted to get them so they wouldn't be drafted. The Marine Corps was all volunteers at that time. Where were you and how old, what were you doing when you heard about the news about Pearl Harbor? <laughs> I was still in high school and was really quickly realized that we were very vulnerable. That on the West Coast, we had nothing. We had no Army, no Air Force. The Navy was at the bottom, bottom of the ocean. So it didn't look very good. We made a lot of talk about how rough and tough, but we had nothing. Well, that changed. And when the newspapers picked up the Marines on Guadalcanal, that was the first time we actually stopped the Japanese. I wasn't part of that. I was still in, <laughs> in high school. No, in August. No, I was working at a grocery store or something. Anyway, went to a boot camp in San Diego, in free training at Camp Elliott, and on July 1st, 1943, they set sail for the South Pacific. Okay. Real quick, uh, what, what did your parents think when they knew you wanted to, well, first of all, you, did you only choose to do the Marine at 17, parents could sit. They have to sign. Did you have to convince them at all? No. My father was in World War I, and his brothers, two brothers were in World War I. One of them was gassed heavily and died a few years after the war was over. No. And both, sooner or later, both, I had an older brother, and a younger brother, all three of us were in the service. Okay. So you didn't have to try too hard to get yeah. in and say okay. It's tough on mama. <laughs> okay. okay, so when, when you're leaving home, heading, to, heading towards boot camp, what, what's in your mind? Oh, I 
that the bird? I had no idea what to expect. You know, it's, and they shave all your hair off and boot you up. But, and I had a bad heart. It wasn't quite bad enough for them to be concerned, but uh, uh, I had been, up until I was a junior in high school, <clears throat> I was never allowed to take PE. In the lower grades, I was never allowed to go upstairs to the second floor. But then it leaked. I had a real strong murmur. It seemed to take care of itself. How, why, dart if I don't. But it never bothered me until now. <laughs> All right, so you're 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 in boot camp. Uh, what you know, the first day you wake up? What do you what do you think? You know, oh man, am I in for it? Yeah, well, I think we look forward to. I mean, we got a lot of a lot of stuff thrown at us, but I took that stuff seriously. I became a in Camp Elliott training. I became a squad leader. Why? Because I took the weekly quizzes seriously. You know, most of my guys the hell with it. They, were, <laughs> they didn't pay attention to anything. And I'd end up, here's this damn dumb little 70 year old skinny kid teaching them how to read a contour map. They didn't know what. Oh. And some of them never did learn. But it was uh, a very uh, experience. So did you know that you guys were going to be going to the Pacific, or did you oh, think you were well, going to the European, or did you? We know for sure. As soon as we got aboard the ship, we are heading for the Pacific. And that's about the time that Things were moving, starting to do. Guadalcanal had been, the battle had been won, but there were still sinking ships. And the Japanese were right there, still bombing. They're still bombing the dark place all the time. And uh, the first first combat issue was, was the, Complete the Solomon Islands. Bogan fills up at the top, and Guadalcanal is down near the bottom. And it's pretty long distance, and Rabaul is right there. And this is that big Japanese naval base. And the uh, concept was that we could land on Bougainville, and CPs would build an air field, and they could bomb the heck out of Rabaul and knock down any, any, any fleets going south. So, now I didn't know that at the time, because they don't tell us the darn thing. What was, what was kind of, was there any like rumors or anything from the other guys when you're going over, like what the Japs were like, or? We don't know, you know, being a, I was a private then. They didn't get your rifle, clean your rifle. It's about all I knew. Anyway, Bougainville was nasty, dirty, wet. I always said that it has two seasons, wet and wetter. It rained all the damn time, and we were living in a swamp which makes it very uncomfortable. That's many night with water up to here in the foxhole and trying to say, how am I going to get out of this damn thing if suddenly a Jap comes by? I'm stuck. I can't see. We finally ended up with either two-man foxholes 
or side by side so you could reach out and touch him. You couldn't see him, but you could touch it. And when that, that worked pretty well. And that was a, it was nasty for a while. Huh? And, and finally about uh, seven or eight days after we landed, the, the Japanese were coming. And we were put on a trail that there are no roads, no roads at all. No such thing where we were on that damn island. And so the CBs had to construct roads, and, which is very difficult. But anyway, the trails, we were right on the damn trail going up, upstream, and I was right on it with a BAR man, that's an automatic rifle, next to me. And that just about dusk, a Japanese patrol came up the trail and he sh shot him up a little bit. And we knew we're going to have a problem tomorrow morning. And of course, we dug in, pulled up a lot, a lot of grenades and ammunition, and all that stuff. In the morning, the goddamn sniper was shooting at us. And, you know, I say he's he's this far away. He was landing between us. And my BAR man says, "Get that guy. Uh, he, you can't see him." But I estimated a trajectory and fired 16 rounds, two clips, up in the trees. And he didn't shoot us anymore. Why? I, I don't think I hit him. Never did. But I, I thought he got a better target. Of course, the thing about snipers, when they got they very concealed, he only got a small area that he could transfer his rifle. He doesn't have a big view because he'd be seen. So I figured, keep farming up there every now and then. We'll keep, keep you under control. Well, about that time when the Japanese attacked, the whole damn bunch of them, and uh, we had a firefight for about six or seven, six hours, I think, constant. And, I can't, I, I was in a very good position. I could see maybe 25 yards or because of the trail. And I sighted in on, you know, see a jack shoot. And how many, I have no idea. Was it the same one? I don't know, I doubt it, I'm pretty sure. Because that, that's all we're close. See, this is the, not, yeah, not in some of the European fights where the artillery is 10 miles away and doing most of the damage. And these guys are right there. And I can see them. We heard them the night before, we could hear them singing and drinking. And my friend Strank, he was in a, next, next to us, but too. He was a screwy son of a gun. He was he never, he always wore a cap. He didn't like helmets. Standing up and shouting obscenities at the Japanese. You know, they're right there. And they shot him back at him. And. A couple hours later, we had a lull in the party, and I looked over. Strike wasn't standing up anymore. He had a helmet on, and he wasn't shouting. He must have been pretty close. 
Anyway, we won that fight. We killed, there was, I don't know, three or four hundred dead Japanese just in front of our little company alone, M Company. It was tough to go for a while. And then we go on patrols, you know. And then late in the month, this is all in November, the brass had a great idea. They're gonna go to, the Japanese were shuttling the newly constructed airfield, which wasn't finished, but there was a, was a large caliber artillery, probably eight inch. And the flyboys don't like that. Yeah. So we're, paratroopers came in, a battalion of them. In our little company, we were about 40% is all we had left. But we were nominated to go with the paratroopers. Okay, that's fine, you know. So we embarked in on Higgins boats about 4 a.m. and went down the coast. On the way, the boat I was in got too close to another one and our ramp got knocked down. They got a front ramp on it. We very carefully moved to the rear to raise the bow or we'd all be it all drowned, because we had so much garbage on us. Didn't lose a man. Transferred to another one, fine. We landed, and this is supposed to be a no opposition area. They'd scouted it out. Scouted it out. They drove by it with a boat. When the sun, we landed, when the sun came up, all I could see were piles of supplies. Looked like mountains of supplies. And I thought, gee, these guys are gonna defend this damn stuff. This is not gonna be a piece of cake like we were told. And we're in a trap. We can't get away. The boats are gone. Well, we attacked. And things were going, losing a lot of people. We were in the wrong place. You know, the Navy sometimes lands us in the wrong spot when they join up with the rest of them. And our lieutenant and our platoon sergeant and our platoon guide, the three top men were all wounded. And so we got a, another lieutenant came up and he said, got to withdraw. And this very brash, I was 18 and one day old, very brash youngster said, there's not that many, we can hold a fort. And the lieutenant said, will you please kindly withdraw? How do you answer that? We withdrew. And on the way, we got back to the, the beach and discovered that we, since we didn't have any in charge of us, and there weren't that many of us to go with, we go look for some wounded. And that's where we got Herschel. We found him up there where we carried him back. One guy, <laughs> we're in a poncho, we all, four of us were holding one quarter each. And the damn elephant grass was about as high as our neck. And you gotta duck down and you can't get through the damn stuff. 
And so we were not making much headway. And my friend in the lab, a BAR man, who stood about 6'5", big man, he picked him up, Herscher, and carried him and dragged him down to the beach. And we got, the boats are coming in. The boats came in a certain distance and they stopped. And they found out that the Japanese were putting mortars in the water. The boats didn't want to come in then. And so we waited till it was dark. And for some reason, the Japanese quit too. The boats came in, we got aboard. Back we went to where we came started from. But that was a very sad experience. Uh, the Marine Corps never wanted to, to admit that because it doesn't look good. But uh, most of our guys in the M Company, the Raiders, picked up Japanese, uh, picked up paratrooper rifles. They had a special automatic rifle. And we, they dropped them and you know, took off. Well, it was their first, first combat. It happens. We didn't, Johnson, Johnson automatic rifle. We didn't keep those very long because the paratroop major came by and wanted them all back, <laughs> which is, and so what. And after that, it was just patrolling. There wasn't much. The, the big, big conflict on Bougainville took place in March. We were gone by then. We left in January. And, and then, but the, we had made these, everybody had made these very fancy dugouts with barbed wire and everything else. So the Army had no difficulty. They took us, took our places. We went back to Guadalcanal established a base camp. Now, when I make a base camp, we build it. The dumb damn Marines lay it out and build it. We don't get help from CBs or... <laughs> uh, anyway, we had a base camp on Portal Canal. And then in March, this was in January. I spent two weeks in the hospital and malaria. We all had malaria. I took Adabert every day. It was yellow as hell, but it didn't do any good. And when I came back, I weren't in the Raiders anymore, in the Fort Marines. And in March, I think, yeah. we suddenly went to Emeru, and that turned out to be you know, a vacation. We had probably three weeks of <laughs> laying on the sand doing nothing, because for a while we had a day and night on a damn machine gun, and the army moved in couple hundred yards down the beach with a 40 millimeter. So I told the guys, hey, that's the thing that's got to do it. We'll sack out from now on, which we did. We shot up the turtle. <laughs> that's about it. Emero, we came back, got replacements, 
started trading again. Yeah, started trading. And then the next step was Guam. And we were the floating reserve for Saipan because they were having a little trouble on Saipan trying to take it. And so we, that's, a, that's the circles I have on the map. Well, uh, back and forth. We were about oh, over a month late in getting to Guam that way. Finally we did, and that was that was combat. They they uh, defended Guam. Well, we landed and took our objective. I was in Fourth Marines. I was at I Company. Yeah, I Company then. So when you guys left the ship, what was going through your head when you were heading towards towards the shore? Well, on the sh ship, uh, that's you know like this, awful. I always, not every night, always manage to sneak up on the deck and hide somewhere, because they didn't like that. But I could sleep it down there in the hole, it was awful. What was it, what was it like heading towards the, the beach, getting ready to? We were in, we were in Higgins boats, or I think we had alligators by then with a ramp on. No, the first alligators had no ramp. We had to go over the side. That was a little bit difficult. You led with all that stuff. Yeah, alligators, they could go over anything. It was, wasn't bad. It was, you know, I hope they don't hit me. That's about all you can do. You can't do anything. Spread out. Don't bunch up. Start shooting at something. If you can find something to shoot at. But we, we took our objective. And it was a heck of a job trying to dig a foxhole on Guam. You go through about this much red mud, and there's coral, hard as a dickens. And our, our tools, our trenching tools, couldn't cut it. So we were basically exposed and red as the devil. They were absolutely red, dirty, filthy. And then we lined up the 4th Marines on the left and the 22nd Marines on the right on Aroda Peninsula. That's when there was a airfield and the former Marine barracks on Aroda. And we proceeded to attack and take that. And it got a little bit difficult at times. But you, you learn how. You know, this is a thing of, of they were dug in with real strong placements. You, you learn how to take them and go around and come to the sides, throw grenades and all that stuff. It was a tough go, but we did that. That's what we got the unit site, the Navy uh, unit citation. The Marine Corps emblem, <clears throat> the Asiatic Pacific area with a little silver star, which is in little five battle stars. That's the American flag. Combat Bronze Star and the Marine Corps emblem for the Raiders. This is a Navy 
unit combination. This is the victory, me victory medal. Everybody gets that. And this is the presidential unit citation. We got that for Fourth Marines for Okinawa. Anyway, and then we went on, we had to help the Third Marines, part of the Third Division up north. And more jungle, slow going. But that pretty soon we had wiped out the main, main masses. So then we go on patrol every day. Go out and always kill three or four Japs at least. It was a, uh, the, the, the Japanese soldier was very good, excellent, except they had beaten the instinct out of him. He didn't know what to do unless somebody told him what to do. It was a, these, these poor guys, and they'd be maybe as many as 10 of them in a bunch, and they were lost, hopeless. And we'd come out and kill them all. Gee. Anyway, then we went back to Waddle Cut Out. Oh, that was good. One of my friends that I know, I played tributes with him every day on the ship. And we got back to Water Canal, and I noted in my account there that I'm in the bridges for 30 bucks. And some 50 years later, I met him at a, one of the Raider conventions. And after a long discussion on inflation and all that stuff, I sent him for breakfast <laughs> the next morning. <laughs> and it was good. <laughs> anyway, we got back to Waddle Canal and started. We did have much training for a while because we had on Bougainville, M Company had about 60% casualties, whereas the third battalion overall only had about 40. For some reason, we had more. And on, on Guam, the fourth, or our battalion, which is the third battalion, we had about 60. 60, 65 percent casualty. So we're short of people again. And while we're waiting for replacements, we didn't have a hell of a lot to do. So they let us let us do jobs in the morning, and then we afternoon we could go swimming or whatever. And some of us would go down to the beach. By the way, that's where the those Japanese troop ships had their own start up in Guadalcanal, just on the beach. They went aground there. Anyway, we throw coconuts out in the waves and practice. I say, I called it Wyatt Earp, shooting from the hip. It was fun. And we got pretty damn good at it. You'd be surprised how good you could get. Anyway, that's one of the and then we had a, <laughs> that poor major, I think he, I was on his list. <laughs> he, fresh from the States, and he had one of these ideas that, you know, you anchor a machine gun and you shoot her over and let the boys crawl along. All our guys had been shot at with nambos. They knew what they sounded like. And so, and I mean, I was 
Well, that's how I was a but squad leader. And she got squad leader. And so I started through there. And I quickly figured out I could get up by these. So I shot through that thing. That near, oh, he turned several colors, hopping mad. Oh, I could do it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So he back, told the guys that. <laughs> My fault, sorry. We'll do it right. And so I crawl a few steps, stop and rest. <laughs> we didn't get halfway for the major called it off. But I was on his list from there on. <laughs> but all my guys were used to it. They didn't have to do that stuff. Waste of time. And then we got replacements, filled the ranks, thought out we're going to, oh, we didn't tell us anything. We got our, oh, and our typical thing is, you know, when the Marine Corps goes, we're now part of the 6th Division. We got another regiment, 29th Marines. And so the ships have to be loaded. Who loads them? Marine Corps. So we worked. I mean, we worked doing that. All the supplies, all the food on the yard. So we get on board the thing, and we still don't know where we're going. Nobody. Finally, we got to Ulithi, which is a great big atoll with a huge harbor, the whole fleet. You look around and, my God, there's ships of all kinds. So we said, oh, oh this is going to be a big something. And then they told us, we're going to Okinawa, and they explained what Okinawa was. And they said this, there's uh, something like, I don't know, 50 or 60,000 enemy troops. Yeah, something like that. And the island was so long, and, and they figured it's about a three or four months operation. Because the Army's got to land a couple of regiments to our divisions. So April 1st, oh, we, at Ulithia, we transferred to an LNT. And that was a, yeah, that's a cork. And it's always like this. And my group, my company, there was no room in the hole. We had cots on the deck, and the deck always had that much water. So our feet were starting to get feet disease. To get off this goddamn LST. Anyway, then we go and land. And where did I get? Oh, well, I'm beside the point. We landed on Okinawa. Very, very little opposition. And you know, where are all these enemy troops? And we turned and went north. The whole damn division. And we'd, uh, march or walk up about 20 miles each day and go off on the sides to look for pockets of the enemy and then come in the rear 
and it worked out very well. Of course, we were good, but, but uh, and then finally we got to this very high peninsula, and the 22nd Marines, 49th Marines, yeah, were having trouble up there, so we went up to help them. And had had a and a tough mountain to climb. Well, that's when our colonel, the story about him, Shapley. He, nobody goes up but with a carry something to eat. And this Shapley was becomes this staff shortage or something. He didn't have anything. So Shapley stops it. The guy says, well, I'm a staff sergeant. And Shapley says, well, I'm a lieutenant colonel. And I'm telling you, pick up that case or whatever it is. Now, nobody goes up there without carries, which is good. Anyway. We had a tough go on the, that damn peninsula, but managed to do it. And we could look down on little Ie Shiba, which is a little island off the north, northwest corner of Okinawa. And Ernie Pyle was killed on that. And we saw the flag at half mast I mean, something was wrong. That's when Roosevelt had died. And Ernie Pyle, I don't know. Uh, I never could get a story of exactly what happened. But I do know that he was a proponent. His European war of riding around in a jeep in the passenger side. No, not in the Pacific. You're dead. That snapper will sit up there for a week, eating a handful of rice, crapping in his helmet to get a shot at an important guy. And if you're a passenger, you're important. So maybe that's what happened earlier. I have no idea what happened to one of our guys. Anyway, Okinawa was, we got rid of that north part. We thought, gee, it's for, where the hell are all these now? Oh yeah, the brass said now, now there's 100,000 Japanese. There were. We didn't have them up here. And well, they're down south. That they better hurry up because get the whole damn damn army here at the rate we're getting these numbers. Anyway, we we then went down south because the army was having trouble moving. The Marine Corps, we you know, go up the hill. Hey, diddle diddle, right up the middle. And that's what they wanted. And Sugarloaf Hill was, it's a western, the western end of the Shuri line. But the Japanese had this very complicated, connected cave system of many stories. Each caves were very, very beautiful thing. And they'd run a artillery piece that already had inside it in. They didn't have to feel they knew exactly where that bush was out there. And they'd, they'd run it out and they'd fire one, two shots 
take it back in, around the curve. And we'd fire guns a hundred or so back, but you can't hit them. They were pinpoint accuracy. And our guys didn't care for that. They, they were, first time we'd ever had real artillery problems on the enemy side. And boy, these, they lost a lot of troops that way. Anyway, we got out of the south end and this damn Sugarloaf Hill, which is nothing really but it was the western end. And 29th Reeds attacked it first, and they took it, I think, eight or nine times. We got pushed off. 22nd was first. I'm sorry. 22nd was first. Got shoved off. Then the 29th took over, and they also took it about eight or nine times, and the last time they managed to hold it. And we replaced them. And that's when they came off looking like this. The guys we replaced, looking straight ahead, not talking, Zombies, not enough sleep and too much dead. I'm gonna sit this here, I'll get a shot at it. Yeah, that it was very, so uh, our turn, we replaced the 29th and I'm supposed to pick out a place to, you know, a machine gun give covering fire to the rifle or two. We're on top now, they can go down the ridge. So I set it up. There's a gunner behind it, the second gunner with the belt, and I was over on the right. And we did that, and then we had a lull, and I looked to the left, about 15 feet away. The same thing, she gun, Three guys by it, only they were all dead. So you think yourself, you picked this place. It might not be the way you wanted. <laughs> oh. Anyway, we, the rifle platoon, got shot up pretty badly trying to get down the dead bridge. But they got down to the bottom dug in, the guys that were left dug in, and that's when I had to go get the food. And that night, the Japanese came from all sides, back and front, both sides, and we guess our guys were really catching the hell. The three leaders of our were all in the same foxhole. And they all, one was killed and two were wounded. So we had nobody. So, uh, you know, I keep saying to, to make, <laughs> make confusion out of chaos, I decided I'd better become a platoon leader for a while anyway. And that wasn't too bad. We go around to each guy and talk to him a little bit. And one of them was uh, one of this young fellow. Now, I was a dutiful Marine. I had cleaned my rifle very carefully, field stripped it before it got dark. So it was ready to go. And I got to this one box, so, and this young fellow, and I don't know. Remember who it was. My rifle won't shoot. I had hell mine will trade you. Because I knew what I had to do. Finish throwing to each one of these. And then I had to walk along the line 
saying, please don't shoot me. I'm from I company, and I'm looking for a L company to, to help us. And I did, I did. Didn't get shot. Found L company, told that lieutenant that I think we're getting control. We don't have many people left, but I don't think, I don't think the Japanese do either. I think we're, okay, I'll be back in a half an hour and let you know. So back I went. I got back to where our guys were, and two bodies were rolling in the mud. It was raining. It was terrible. <laughs> and one of them, the Jap and one of our guys, and they said, you got a 45, shoot the Jap. I said, hell, I can't tell one from another. And one of my guys said, I can, okay? And, and he did. He did dispatch the right one. And if I, uh, that damn Marine was hitting with a canteen, beating on the Jap with his canteen. <laughs> Harry the canteen. Anyway, we had a tough night. <laughs> now, I went back and told the lieutenant, we don't need you. I think we're okay. And in the morning, I've forgotten how many. There weren't a hell of a lot of us left. Anyway, there was enough. We called it a platoon. And the captain asked me to stay in command of the platoon. You know, I don't know. Gee, I don't know. I'm not a rifle platoon leader. I'm a damn squad leader of machine guns. Uh, so now I have a, and that stayed that way for a whole time. That was funny. We started that same day with skirmish line. I think we had, uh, I originally should have 40, 40, about 41 people in the rifle platoon and uh, 11 or 12 machine gunners. We didn't have any of that. We had 20, 20 something people. That's all we had left. And we spray out the skirmish light. And, uh, and all of a sudden, something said, I gotta say, turn around and shoot. And I whirled around. Shot from the hip. And Jap was in those darn pop-up foxholes. Well, he, he crouched out inside those things. You know he doesn't have a rifle because he can't get it in there, but he's got a grenade for sure. Well, he didn't have an arm. The Japanese grenades have to hit something hard. Helmet, rifle butt, bang, and there he goes. But I knocked him down. Corman patched him up. We took him prisoner. First one. Instinct. Instinct. Yeah, quite a place. Well, it got worse. Okinawa. Uh, sum it up. We ended up. M Company at 117% casualties because we got replacements. And the last bunch of replacements, I had a couple of guys who were 39 drafted. 39 years old, old enough to be my father, and I was only 19. Huh. Did they take? Did they take orders or? Oh yeah, uh, they didn't know a damn thing, so it's not. They stayed alive too. And one of the most difficult things 
because how do you keep them alive for three? I figure if it's three, if I can keep them alive for three days, then they're on their own because they will understand a few things. And I always put them with a so-called veteran. He may be 20 years younger than you, but he's do what he does. When he runs, you run. When he walks, you walk. When he shoots, you shoot. Keep him alive. Three days. And hope. So. Huh. Anyway, Okinawa was bad. We Iwo Jima had more more people killed. We had a hell of a lot more casualties. It, it was a. Uh, They say they get used to the right there, you know. But you learn how to hit those damn. I had one very interesting experience. I needed, <clears throat> or two, what we call pill boxes. I knew damn well they got japs in. Got to knock them out. So I went down to the company CP and said I need a. The demolition man. Knock out these. And about that time, one of those screaming rockets, screaming Mimi, came in. And seven or eight Marines from the concussion, including two demolition men. The problem with the demolition men, they were caps around the middle. All the caps go off, it blows them apart. So, no demolition men available. What are we going to do? Well, I borrowed a couple of charges and caps and fuses and said, well, we'll figure out what to do. And I got back with the guys, and I got to thinking about this. Who the hell? This is something was always a volunteer job. And you don't, and they learn how to do this. Who, who can do this? And I, I can't ask. And nobody, none of the new fellows, they don't have the foggiest idea what to do. But we, some of us, blew up a lot of trees on New Caledonia. We learned how to fool with that stuff. So I, hmm, I volunteer. And what that means, the only thing difficult is you take these are satchel charges. They look like that, about the size of that thing. And you put the, and the only part that's really difficult is crimping the, the cap around the fuse. They use pliers. And that's scary. If you do something wrong, you're going to lose your jaw. Well, then you, you get it cramped. You put a short fuse. You light it with a cigarette. It's the first time I smoked in my life. I had two cigarettes because I had two charges, one for each, each dugout. And you light that short fuse, 
throw that charge, you have a guy here with a machine gun or BAR shooting just to keep the, the enemy away, and you want it to, the minute it lands, you want it to go off or to come back, and that's not friendly. That's unfriendly to have it come back. So, so we did. Two of them worked fine. And I unvolunteered for that job. And let the experts do it. I don't want to do this anymore. Anyway, it just kept going on. We got down to the end of the island. And we're out of ammunition. No problem. They'll airdrop up to us. Great. Here come the planes. Drop the box. We can run over there and get O three. O three clips. Five in a row. Won't work in the M1. So now we have single shot. We got a pair of single shot, right? Shit. Ah. 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 Anyway, we survived that. We got back to the, going back to the, Rest camp, theoretically, and goddamn Major, who liked the Sergeant Major, it's real Marine Sergeant Major, he's got big, strong, loud voice. Picture, poster band. Anyway, he get killed because he fooled around with these caves. Anybody else stays out of them, he didn't have any sense. So the majors knock out those caves. I said, that's fine, Major. I came by here, what, three, four days ago, and I asked you for permission to knock out the caves. And you said, no, move out. He didn't like that. I said, we don't have any charges, we have a few grenades, we have single shot rifles, we don't have a flamethrower, we don't have anything. I don't care, knock that shit out. So I started stalling. At least, let me bring up a machine gun anything. And it got to the point where I told the guys, we got to go, guys. And we moved just a few feet. The major was on the radio with, with the head of the, with the battalion head or regiment head or somebody. And he said, shut it down. We're all going back. So I said, <laughs> which we did. Then I had a wonderful experience of going up to get a field commission. And who do you think was the head of the group of officers? The major. The same one. I didn't have a chance, <laughs> which was okay anyway. Actually, according to the Marine Corps, you had to be 20 and I would. That's fair. <laughs> they could have predated it, you know, if they wanted to. So that was it. And then they felt badly about that, I guess, because they wanted me to go back for V-12. And uh, 
Lieutenant in charge says, did I pick that up? You're, you're a cinch to go. I said, look, I got up for B-12 four or five times. They go through the company records, said, and I'm the only guy with a army of GCT thing in the 130s. And everybody else. And so I go up there and they ask all these people. And the only question that they ever ask you that means anything is, let's say, and why do you want to go back to the States? Corporal Cunder. You're supposed to say so that I can be of more service to my country and to the Marine Corps, sir. And boy, that, you know. And I always say, they get out of these goddamn hearts. Back I go, and the other guys would go. That didn't go over too well. That did not. <laughs> but it was all right. I would. It was a, a great experience. How do you? I used to tell the kids that, at uh, Old Christian. They say, "How come you weren't wounded?" I look at him and say, skill, of course. And they say, no, no, no. Nobody believed me. And you have instinct, instinct at the right time, plus a hell of a lot of luck. Oh, another instinct. On Okinawa again, we were attacking and there was a low dip in the hills. And for some reason, when I got there, something said, run. Nobody run. I ran. Got shot at a couple of times, but no hits. The guy behind me didn't get the message. He died on the stretcher. But it's the instinct. Why? No, no reason. What, uh, can you tell me the story uh, uh, about the food one more time? Because we talked off camera about that. Pardon? Can you tell me about going to get the food, uh, all the supplies and everything that we talked about off camera? Uh, you have, have to say it lower. Goodbye. The, uh, can you tell me the story about going to get the supplies and then both you? Oh, can yeah. Just because we didn't, I didn't get that on camera. Oh, so okay. What, what island was that? Okinawa. Okinawa, okay. Yeah, we, after we come down the ridge, the, uh, we got word that, as I say, the, I call them the rear echelon commandos had food for us, rations. And so I looked at that and I was, charge. I was acting, acting charge of both, both machine, both machine guns at that time. And I thought, gee, I can't order somebody to have to do that. They're going to get shot at. And who don't they need the most? Well, that's probably me. I don't take the guys to pull the trigger, carries them. So I got, and one of the ammo carriers volunteered to go with me. And we zigzagged around, crossed this open area, got shot at it a few times, no hits, got over to where the supplies were supposed to be, and we each picked up a case of sea rashes, put it up on our shoulders, and we started it back. And we got part of the way back, 
by that sniper or snipers. I'm not sure whether there are more than one. Oh, boy, oh, close. Ooh. So we both hit a shell hole side by side. It's waited there for a few minutes, shooting stopped. And I said, told him, now let's go. Boys are getting hungry. And Al did not respond. And so I rolled him over, and he had no pulse. I made sure he had no pulse. He knew what was going on. And I picked up both cases and both rifles and staggered back to the line without getting shot at. I think one other time, again on Okinawa, we had, this is on a, on a Naha airfield was. We crossed this huge drainage ditch. It was about 15 feet wide and water up to at least waist deep, maybe a little higher places. We crossed that. We're moving out, and boy, all of a sudden, the bullets from the back, the rear, whoo, that burned my hair. And I turned around, and there were three Japanese soldiers shooting at me. You know, about, oh, a few yards, not very far away. And so I started at a one, two, three. I hit all three of them. My rifle jabbed. I dropped out on one knee to steady myself, clear the rifle, and I found out there was a fourth one. I couldn't see him. He was on the near side of the ditch. The other ones were on the far side. And he was, I couldn't see him at all. And that son of a gun was throwing grenades at me. But he was falling short. And about that time, thank goodness, two BAR men came up on the flag and finished the job. <laughs> but that was, mm. Ooh. What went through your head if you, you were clearing your rifle and this guy's throwing grenades at you? Good thing I cleaned that rifle. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, it was quite an experience. What, what was it like? Uh, you said you were in Tokyo and you could see the, uh, the ship that the Japanese were going to surrender on. What's that? What was it like being in Tokyo right about the time of them? Oh, we weren't in Tokyo. Or, okay. We, you know, it was, Tokyo was flat. You know, it burned out. Uh, LeMay did a heck of a job on that. That was one of the brightest things that hard-headed Air Force guy did. You know, they, we, the Air Force, nobody else knew a damn thing about jet streams. They didn't realize that when you're dropping bombs from 30,000 feet, you're, Hell, I didn't go anywhere. But those winds are strong. And so they weren't doing any good. So LeMay said, LeMay said, asked, what are those houses made of? Paper and wood. We come in at 200 feet instead of 30,000, and we drop fire bombs. And then it's they killed more people in Tokyo than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined because of that. It was one thing I, at the bottom of the Japanese, their stupid religion, I guess, we, on Naha, 
after after I shot those three guys, we pushed out of the beach, and I happened to have an interpreter with me. I have no idea why, but he was there. And the Japanese quit fighting. So I was getting delayed, so I said, I told him, what the heck do they want to do? I went, surrender, okay. He came back and said they want to blow themselves up. Tell them to hurry up, because we want to get out of here. And they get across those damn tank mines, anti-tank mines. Look like a big teardrop. Big Hersey skin. They lay across those things. Pieces of man flying. Gruesome sight. What the hell's the matter with them? I said, any goddamn fool with the lowest private down knows the Japanese knew they're losing. They ain't got a prayer. You think they want to save some of these men to start the new race? These are the good guys. The four Fs were in Japan. The draft dodgers. You got to end up with that. Why? I couldn't figure out why they do that. That was a unsatisfactory ending. It was easy, and uh, we had no trouble. We, I, I had sent my diary home with somebody who was going back because I didn't know what to expect. So if if we land in Japan, and somebody, it's about my turn, <laughs> and no trouble at all. Oh, we had one problem. I have a bunch of difficult people, these X-Raiders. The, uh, in Yokosuka, Yokosuka, there is a, a little, a little battleship that would help beat the Russians in 1906 or 1904, whenever it was, you know, got a shrine inside, Admiral Solo. And in that glass thing was a hair from Togo's beard. Somehow, the hair disappeared. And so, he told the boys, somebody got to put a hair back in. The hair got back in. But it wasn't for Bavir. <laughs> That's <was> great. <laughs> so, what, what was uh, what was it like when when Japan officially surrendered? What was what was going on around your your, your group of guys? They they did. They accepted everything. Uh, it, I think MacArthur that time was correct. He did not take anything. Uh, nobody tried to hang the emperor or burn him down or anything. He basically a figurehead. But the Japanese believe him. And so by keeping him at, there, and he said, we've lost. No trouble. There was no trouble. It was wonderful. Very nice. <laughs> what was it like coming home after all that? Well, that was a problem. Oh, coming home on on the last 
couple of days at Okinawa, one of the guys had been through Bougainville and Guam, Okinawa. I think he got wounded a couple of times, but he was still a, one of the original ones. I was worried about him because every he kept digging. He dug a fox, so he kept going down. Let's see. Well, anyway, I knew where he was. And all of a sudden, I see him out of the hole, standing up, shooting at the ground. He fired eight rounds at the ground. I thought, oh, God. Now he's lost it. I got to go take care of him. So I went over there, and it was a damn snake, five and a half feet, I measured. What kind of snake? I don't know. But he shot eight rounds in the head and hit the darn thing. The muzzle blasted, doesn't that? Well, I had the entrenching tool, I cut off his head with that shovel. Well, that same guy, we got on the ship going home, and he wore his life preserver, k Park life preserver, every day. Slept in the darn thing. He did not take it off. He was bound to determine if the ship went down, he got to go up. We got to the harbor, San Diego, and he said, I don't need this anymore. Threw it over to the side. And he died. All the air out of it. Those little pockets in, in the capo. It sucked like a rock. And the look on his face was worth the trip. <laughs> Ron the Digger. What was it like seeing your parents again? For me, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, my parents tried, of course, and my sister tried, but hell, I I can't even talk to them, really. So I did all the work that I could around the, where we lived, and then I contacted my former first gunner. He lived in Texas, and I went to Texas for like eight or nine months. Lived with him and his, and his sister's family. When I came back, I had enough sense by going to college, I applied. And <laughs> I went in to see the bath. But I was the best at that time, not now. I was the best math student. And he, he said, oh, OK, you survived. Here's where you're going to school. And he had to be a lit. I never heard of that. I was the Bay Area. All I knew was Cal and Stanford. They weren't on there. But here's one in California. It's Pomona College. So I applied for it. In the Claremont. State Claremont, the first of the Claremont colleges, on-campus school, which is kind of nice. I very, I had a car, of course. I very carefully sold it. I said, you gotta give this a fair chance, and this would be a crutch. In the first year, was a little bit difficult. After that, it was brief. 